So I was doing a lot of environmental organizing and thinking a lot about human environment relationships um, and came to human geography in my master's as a sort of combination of these two, the human and the environmental. Um, and it was, I wasn't really interested in technology at the beginning, but being an environmental organizer and talking to so many folks about their relationships to climate change and their feeling of precarity sort of um, as like youth confronting climate change. Um, I was also became really fascinated with watching people simultaneously having this um, really strong connection to technology. You know, like I, I finished my master's um, in 2017. And so at this point, every, everybody had phones that they were using all the time. Um, everybody was becoming deeply entangled in social media, and this was a lot of the like, way people were living their lives. Um, and I was really interested in these like environmentalist communities, seeing how people negotiated this their presence in cyberspace, right, or their identity formation in cyberspace, um, at the same time that they were sort of struggling through their identities or their futures on Earth in this material world. University of Texas doctoral student Claire Fitch joins the Plutopia podcast this time. We discuss her doctoral research into virtual reality simulations of nature. We also explore the impacts of capitalism on the environment, AI, and much more. Hey everybody, welcome to yet another episode of the Plutopia podcast. Today our guest is Claire Fitch. Claire is a PhD candidate in the Department of, this is fascinating, Geography and the Environment at the University of Texas at Austin. And her research contemplates the role that simulated natures in virtual reality play in shaping trajectories of human environment relations. In order to unravel the current forms and functions of this medium, she investigates various ways in which VR is used to provide experiences of nature and consider how these natures act as arenas in which human environment relationships are reconsidered, renegotiated, contemplated, and, act, and enacted. This research centers, you can tell I'm reading this, actually, I got this from Claire, but I really, I, we want to get it all. This research centers the socio-material entanglements of virtual nature environments. It contextualizes this within a broader discussion of mediated subjectivity within techno-capitalism and considers the overlap of the two as a dynamic and central geographic question of the Capitalocene epic. And with that, I guess my first question is, I, I actually, so I have thought in terms of the Anthropocene for quite a while now, and uh, I hadn't really considered the Capitalocene, Capitalocene epic. How did those two differ, Capitalocene and Anthropocene? Yeah, so it's sort of an ongoing debate about, um, yeah, how people want to name our current geologic epoch, right? Um, where the Anthropocene, the argument against it has been that it sort of distributes like equal um, agency to all human actors, um, where people come back at that with the Capitalocene saying, hey, it's not actually about all ways of life on Earth. It's not all about the way that people are relating to their environments. Um, equally, it's actually more about capitalist practices that have shaped um, the way that our current environment is um, degrading. And so some people say it was like the birth of the industrial age or the beginning of the industrial age that started off the Capitalocene. Um, other people say it's more as production ramped up um, or when we hit a certain level of carbon in the atmosphere. So there's um, debates still ongoing about this. Um, I, I like the way that it does this and it says, hey, let's not actually just say it's humans presence on earth that is changing our geologic relations it's saying this is a particular economic that's changing these relations but is that saying that capitalism is so pervasive i mean it's not 100 percent pervasive right there are are parts of the earth where capitalism would be seem an odd concept so is it just the the force of capitalism that makes it so important to the shaping of the environment yeah, I think we can see how capitalism's effects reach parts of the earth that it might not even be practiced in, right? Um, when we talk about like permafrost melting, or we talk about global warming, um, or we talk about industrial 
production and the offsets, environmental offsets of this, whether it be like pollution um, or labor practices, whatnot, that it reaches like far stretches of the globe, even in communities where um, it might not be practiced to its fullest extent. There's a, uh, a disconnect with uh, capitalism, or it used to be a disconnect with capitalism in China, and that seems to be not so much the case anymore since a lot of their recent developments are very capitalism uh, oriented. And uh, how do you think that changed? Because it, it used to be, you know, uh, you know China was a, a, a different place, but when we started sending all of our industry over there, that changed dramatically. And I think it also changed, helped change the environment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you think about globalization, I guess, or the effects of globalization and um, sort of interweaving many different economies together on each other, um, that, yeah, I think that the actions or the practices or the economic models of one country that is very powerful, such as the U.S., uh, does resonate throughout all of the other import-export economies and all of the other um, industries that's entangled with, especially given the fact of um, there being so many like global industries, right, that are not particularly even tied to one nation, might be rooted in one nation, but practice um, and have different sorts of uh, manufacture and industrial um, production across many different nations. Um, so yeah, I think that we see capitalism affecting all sorts of economies, whether it's affecting it through actual production practices or just like an ethos, you know, or like a mindset or um, yeah, a sort of culture as well. Maybe you can think of capitalism as a tornado blowing through. It's kind of like that. It has a lot of force for sure. Uh, so you, your master's degree is in human geography. And of course, people who have studied like the kind of typical geography course you might have in, in undergraduate studies or in even high school, whatever, um, may think of geography differently, but can you sort of define what it means to say human geography? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a sort of strange bifurcation in geography as a discipline right now um, that people are working to sort of mesh together more. Um, but there's a physical geography that we know, right, as like cartography, mapping of space, a lot of um, analysis of like soil or storms or agriculture, these sorts of like real physical um, aspects to the earth. And then human geography says, like, let's now think about human environment relationships and how, so if you're studying agriculture, it'd be thinking more about the culture of food production or the culture of consumption um, or the agricultural practices that certain communities have. And so in this way, human geography tries to really center um, the human environment relationship as a means of understanding earthly processes and changes. Um, and so within human geography, there's a whole lot of subdisciplines as well, like folks study political geography, right, thinking about like gerrymandering or the drawing of borders. Um, people can study urban geography and think about city planning and how um, city, yeah, cities are laid out. They can think about uh, sustainability, right, how like global governance of resources happens. Um, and what I do is called media geography primarily. So this is thinking about how technology is reorganizing our relationships to space and place. Um, so people could study like the train, right? Or the telephone or Wi-Fi is thinking all these things that sort of give humans a new ability or a new relationship um, to the globe and to their connections on the globe. Um, and yeah, I, within that subdiscipline study virtual reality as this sort of um, new space being with a new spatiality. So when you've, when you first started studying human geography, uh, were you thinking about virtuality initially or uh, virtual reality initially, or, or did you come to that after you had already started working within the, the discipline of geography? You know, yeah, I, in undergrad, I studied environmental studies um, and sociology. And so I was doing a lot of environmental organizing and thinking a lot about human environment relationships. Um, and came to human geography in my master's as a sort of combination of these two, the human and the environmental. Um, and it was, I wasn't really interested in technology at the beginning, but being an environmental organizer and talking 
to so many folks about their relationships to climate change and their feeling of precarity sort of um, as like youth confronting climate change. Um, I was also became really fascinated with watching people simultaneously having this um, really strong connection to technology. You know, like I, I finished my master's um, in 2017. And so at this point, every, everybody had phones that they were using all the time. Um, everybody was becoming deeply entangled in social media. And this was a lot of the like way people were living their lives. Um, and I was really interested in these like environmentalist communities, seeing how people negotiated this, their presence in cyberspace, right? Or their identity formation in cyberspace um, at the same time that they were sort of struggling through their identities or their futures on earth in this material world. Um, and so I, I wanted to sort of start questioning how cyberspace was functioning for these people, for myself, if it felt sort of like an escape or like a relaxing respite from the trauma of in confronting environmental degradation um, or what sort of new social relations it was offering us. Um, and then virtual reality came to me as like, this is sort of the apex of this dream of a controlled environment that does not really have earthly relation, um, that you can live in a new cyberspace, a new world, um, and not necessarily have to see yourself or your future foreclosed by what's going on on our physical environments. Well, virtual reality has been hyped as the next big great uh, advancement for quite some time. Recently, it's taken some hits. Uh, Meta, <laughs> formerly known as the artist, formerly known as Facebook, uh, tried to make a big uh, virtual reality uh, step forward, and it seemed to have fallen flat on its face. Does that seem to be what's happening with virtual reality, or is it just those uh, offshoot things like Meta that you know stand out? But there are other people who claim it's really a great thing. Yeah, I mean, I think most of the people I talk to that are really interested in VR are really bummed out about what Meta's done for it. Um, I think it's pretty widely considered a big failure. <laughs> um, I think it, for a bunch of reasons, um, I think what they're trying to do is simulate, uh, well, what they're trying to do is simulate work, mostly sim like workplace scenarios. They're trying to simulate social interactions um, and they're trying to simulate exercise and these sorts of like leisure activities. Um, each of these things they've done with sort of like a uninspired, I would say, uh, graphic quality and just been putting out technology so fast without um, doing enough user testing and doing enough sort of hearing from the community what wants to be built. Um, so that a lot of it is entirely, still, you know, headsets that have been around for a while are still very glitchy and very hard to use. Um, and so this sort of the, the idea and the dreams of VR, that it can be this creative tool and that you can build worlds in it, that you can connect in new ways, um, see new places, have entirely new spatial experiences. These dreams seem to be sort of um, really circumscribed by the limits that Meta has put on both the hardware and the software that they offer. Um, I think you know, I think it, it does like put a hit because I think there, in public discourse, there's a whole lot of understanding VR through meta now. And so people are kind of like not interested in it because that's what's out there in the world. Um, but I'm also like seeing a lot of reaction from people that as hopefully like meta takes less of a center stage, there's going to be other developments um, coming from other companies that maybe have different like production protocols in line that might be more exciting. Um, Apple's actually set to release their VR headset on Monday, which is supposed to be like an enormous announcement for the VR community. So we'll see how that unfolds. Well, one thing that always struck me about VR is it, I mean, it's, it's kind of a heavy technology, cre creating a graphical environment. Um, and uh, even though we've been talking about VR since the early 90s, and, and that's certainly been a vision for some people that, uh, that they found compelling, it appears to me that the technologies that really have caught hold and have been most powerful have been based primarily on messaging and to some extent sharing media, you know, like uh, while people were kind of thinking about building virtual reality as a thing, SMS and various forms of text messaging were just like taking off. And could it be that people would really prefer not to 
go into a full-blown virtual reality, but would rather be in a uh, having a more text-based experience. Yeah, I think most people have a lot of distaste for the idea of putting on a headset, right? There's a whole lot of like vulnerability and strangeness that happens when you do that. Um, and it takes a lot, right, to sort of like cordon yourself off from the world. It's hard to drink a glass of water, you know, it's hard to respond yeah. to text message. It's hard not to bump into things in your room. Um, and I think most people don't want that. I think AR might have like a, a softer sort of opening for people in this way that a lot of like AR technologies I've seen people talking about recently are things as simple as um, like voice text, right? Or like instruction manuals or something on glasses. Well, sure. Like so I think if you're right that like what people love to use technology for mostly I think is interpersonal connection, right? And communication um, and VR can do that, but in it doing that is also is like limiting your actual interpersonal connection. So like during COVID, it had a certain role, right? Um, if you're working from home, it has a certain role. If you're a gamer, you're like interconnected with people on VR platforms, it has a certain role. But I think it it it, it does feel very different to me um, than just the the primary texting and people in your community or your daily life. Well, gamer, sure. Gamers have really compelling virtual realities of a sort, but they're like two dimensional virtual realities. I mean, we all know people who will not go to a 3D movie because it, you know, it makes them queasy or it gives them a headache or whatever. I think it's it's really hard to imagine that people will wear headsets to experience a three dimensional virtual reality. But you know, I mean, you can look at Second Life and you can see that uh, it is possible to build a fairly creative and compelling two dimensional virtual reality. Yeah. And it can be lighter, you know, than than what they're talking about building. And that's what, you know, I, I couldn't really get that straight when I was hearing the talk from Meta about the virtual reality they wanted to create. Were they really trying to go full blown 3D? And it appears that they were, uh, but I kept thinking, well, you know, why don't you at least just look at Second Life and look at what they have done. I mean, Second Life never took off in a huge way, but it certainly had and continues to have uh, adoption, you know, a pretty decent adoption. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really interesting to me. I keep on asking VR developers, like, what do you think is special then about um, the difference between a 2D surface, right, and immersive VR. And it's always these these really three points of immersion, right, um, multi-sensory and embodiment, where people feel like that are really into VR, feel that these three things like do offer you a different human experience, right? Um, and that's sort of like what a lot of my work is really fascinated in too, is like, what is this embodied experience of being in a new space, right? Like what can that afford or what can that, the limit in the way that you're experiencing just like being a human or experiencing your life or your own subjectivity. Um, the immersive aspect, you know, I have done a lot of VR at this point and there is um, something really put you in a world that is maybe more, more immersive, I guess, just than looking at your computer screen, right? Or playing like gesturally, right? If you can be playing a game where you're doing gestures, it's something different maybe than using a controller. Um, but if the different is uh, worth it or, you know, matters that much, I think that's a totally subjective thing that some people love and some people really, really don't. Yeah, I guess it's just the question of whether, I mean, there's various levels of ex a simulation, I guess, that you can have from the very basic 2D simulation to this fully embodied in, in virtual space experience that requires, I don't know, you might have a suit that can simulate touch and that sort of thing. And it just, to me, it seems like that is, is, I don't know, it almost seems dehumanizing to me to to try to create that kind of experience. Um, maybe I'm just old. I mean, I don't know. I always say, like, I think I've been more immersed in books than a VR experience of it, right? Because when you're reading a book, you're 
you're doing active imagining, right? And you're having to think of characters or think of what things look like. So you're you're really engaged in the process of the world building yourself, um, where VR like gives you this world, right? And says that it's giving you this full human experience. Um, and that's what's really interesting too, is thinking like, say you're giving me visual, auditory, maybe haptic information, maybe even scent information about what it's like to like be um, on Mount Fiji, right? Um, then like what's missing from that though? Like what can't it do? Because there are definitely things that it can't simulate about what it feels like to be in a place, right? Or to have an experience. Um, but it claims that it can like through digital reproduction of the senses. And so that's the sort of interesting like embodiment question is like what, yeah, where is this falling short? And what does that mean about our experiences of like being on earth or communicating um, that it just can't do? I, I was first exposed to VR and AR, you know, from uh, science fiction. I read a lot of science fiction. And the VR part never really grabbed onto it. But a, uh, augmented reality certainly speaks to what you know, the work that you know, John and I do would be great if we had, you know, just those little glasses that allows you to scroll a little, you know, research in front of you as you're doing an interview. I always thought that would just be a dream come true. And when yeah. Google came out with the Google Glass, I thought, oh, this might be, I didn't know it was not. So is there, do you see anything really on the horizon that will make AR really happen? Because it hasn't so far. Yeah, I think that AR is going to have a real um, surge soon. I was at this conference recently called Laval Virtual, which is like this big global expo of VR, AR technologies um, and AR glasses. They had like a whole bunch of models and people making them um, that it feels like that technology is coming really soon. And to me, that does seem much more useful, right? And that you still have this connection with your world. You're able to see the people you're talking to, but you can have enhanced information. Um, HTC, the Vive, their VR headset, they've just come out with a really, I think it's a kind of cool new model where it's like an AR headset that can switch into a VR mode. Um, so in this way, like a lot of new VR headsets are playing with this as well, where they have like cameras on the outside of the headset, um, that there will always like, there's a mode that you can switch into where you're actually seeing your world. So I think this is going to be big. Um, I think the thing about AR that's really kind of crazy tech wise is um, like the contextual awareness and the data collection that it allows where like if you're using it to draw information about a conversation with someone you're having, they have to then be able to recognize that person's face, pull from some database that you've given them access to about information about them, um, and then feed you that information. So there's and they have to use the context right of where you are, what sort of information you need, um, what kind of conversation you're having. So there's a whole lot of algorithmic analysis, I think, that goes into AR that is, you know, as they develop the technology could be incredibly useful and also something to like really keep an eye on of how that data is being collected and used, I think. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like it could be a, a highly interactive experience um, that, I mean, that the other like hot thing that people are talking about now is AI and I could see AI having a relationship with AR in presenting uh, information on the fly, inter kind of interacting with the experience you have as you move through the world. And I can't help but think that that was, that that is, that that's really going to evolve and that that's going to be the more practical thing than a full-blown immersive virtual reality. Yeah, me too. It seems much more useful and I can see like practical applications that I would actually really like to use it for, you know, and I can see a lot of it, um, even just education wise or like city history, you know, walking around Austin and getting pop-ups of what's going on, environmental awareness, knowledge, things like that could be really useful. Um, and I think that, you know, that we already are like living in this sort of augmentation all the time in that, like, we can just pull up information on our phone or we use Google Maps to like navigate through the city. All of this is sort of like this layering of data and information that we already are interacting with all the time. Um, so AR, yeah, seems like really sort of on the cusp for me is something that I don't think it would be very difficult for people to transition to. Um, and yeah, I don't know, in terms of the fact that like VR came is coming before it in the hype. I find really fascinating that I'm not sure 
if it's like sort of a method of preparing people, you know, easing them, giving them the big scary thing first so that the AR thing can maybe be integrated into society more simply. Um, Cause yeah, I don't know. I think VR is, it's a much harder sell, I think. I, I, and Google Maps is a really good example of workable, viable AR that's, that's being used right now. And I can tell you, I was in California last week and I would still be there uh, if it wasn't for Google Maps, I would be lost somewhere. So it's definitely powerful and helpful. Um, I, I'm wondering about in, just in the research you're doing and in, the, in your studies, uh, could you kind of describe some of the simulated natural environments that you've looked at and how they were being used? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's see, there's a couple ways I'm seeing people do nature simulation the big ones um are like through education right so there's a lot even like on meta's oculus headset there's a lot of programs that are teaching you the perspective of like being a bug pollinating a flower or um telling you about glaciers melting you know there's a lot of education going on there um that is like certainly useful um for certain contexts the stuff that i've been seeing and like really excited by recently is folks making artworks that are sort of like in human environment relationships differently um, or future human environment relationships. So for instance, I saw this one called Symbiosis recently um, at South By that was based off this philosopher Donna Haraway's work, um, who she talks all about like um, interspecies relations and like building sustainable environments. So in this um, program, they had six different characters, each is a different like critter that they made up um, that is some sort of like hybrid being. And the point of the program is that you all like have to learn how to collaborate um, as different species to create the sustainable environment. Um, and this experience included like haptic technologies and where there's air pressure. Mine had like a gill under my neck that was making me breathe like with a gill. Um, it had sense um, and had visuals, auditory and um, yeah. Oh, and in the full one, they also give you a little like snack. So they have taste as well. But this one I found really interesting because it put the immersions in this state where you're all having a different experience because you're all different critters and you all like are seeing a different part of the VR. Um, and so what that does is at the end of it, we all came together and everyone's really curious, like asking each other what they saw, what's going on, trying to make sense of the full experience. And so I, I really liked this thing that it was teaching you lessons about sort of cohabitation um, and sustainable relationships in the VR. But then after the VR, when you take it off, you're also having these like really intimate discussions with people about experience and trying to render each other's experience to each other, um, which is kind of a beautiful practice as well. In the, when I was doing it, I was part of this like multi-body creature that one person was the head, I was the body, and another person was an AI controlling what we ate. And so the three of us were strapped together with our hands in these suits. And it was like incredibly intimate, really strange. You know, we're all strangers, really uncomfortable. Um, but it was like one of the craziest experiences I've had in a very long time. And I think that's something that I see people, VR artists, like doing this really creative work to think, hey, we have this opportunity to sort of choreograph someone's experience, right? Um, and what can we do with that? Like what kind of ethic can emerge out of that? What kind of thinking can we bring people into by giving them this like state with sort of a meditative state that draws them out of their present? Um, so that's what that's one of the coolest like ecological ones I've seen recently that philosophically I thought was doing really interesting work for sure. Yeah, it's sort of it seems analogous to the effect of travel. You know, anything that you do that puts you into a somewhat different experience, different culture, whatever. Uh, will expand your sense of the world and your sense of yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That it's just, yeah, it's experiences. And I think the the point of it, I guess, then for me is thinking about how present then the digital is in in mediating your experience, right? Like it's always present if you're using Google Maps or if you're on a plane or if you're even using um, a paper map to look at restaurants in Italy or whatever um but in VR right you have to like I think the the attention to how you're being mediated is what's really important um because it does sort of attempt to recede from your awareness right that like to put on the headset um to be fully immersed is to not be aware 
of the technology, right? To not be thinking, oh God, I'm in VR, to be truly in the scene. So I, have a, sense, yeah. I have a vague memory of a, an installation in Second Life year, that, years ago. Uh, I saw it, but I don't really remember a lot about it. But what it was, was it was a simulation of uh, schizophrenic's per perspective. Mm so that you could get at least some sense of, of what it's like to be schizophrenic. Wow. And yeah, I mean, I was, I was, I got in there and looked at it. I, I think that it was, it was sort of like a, a demo level experience. It really hadn't been uh, completely fleshed out. Uh, and I don't know whether they did more with it, but that to me, that seems I mean, medical uses of virtual reality seem particularly compelling. You could have, for instance, the simulation of a particular surgery in order to train surgeons, and you could build a lot of variations, especially with AI, you could build variations into those simulations to like throw things at them that they might actually encounter that is not kind of on the book. Because, you know, the, the way a, a physician or a surgeon uh, is inherently trained is to uh, have a sense of the body as a template kind of. I mean, just a, 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 uh, a constructed view of the body as though all bodies were the same. And of course, everybody is different. And you're constantly, anybody who's watched a, do, a, phys, a medical show on television knows this, you're constantly going to be confronted with things that are way off the norm and you're going to have to figure out on the fly how to deal with them. Uh, you could model that very effectively, I think, with a, a virtual reality experience. And to me, that seems more compelling than just the idea of creating a, a three-dimensional store that people can walk through and, you know, buy chocolate off the shelves. Yeah, I think for training purposes, it does seem, especially medical or like really high cost training purposes, it seems like there's a lot of opportunity there, especially in like big machinery, right? If you like want to train on it before you're putting yourself in a dangerous situation, I think medical ones is a really cool um, simulation for sure. In terms of like ecological things too, I've also seen some programs. There was one called Forager at South by that gave you the experience of being a, a mushroom, like, and put you into a sort of mycelial network. And in this way, all of these sort of projects that give you the experience of what it is like to be something else. I'm a little wary sometimes of what it's like, this is what it's like to have schizophrenia, or this is what it's like to have autism, or this is what it's like to be a different race, a different gender, all these things that it becomes a little sticky there, the lines of what does it mean to have an experience, right? And to take the headset off, how you had it, um, but I think that, like you're saying, with training, with medical things, with even how I experienced what it was like to be a mushroom, right, that there is something that you are learning or that you're taking away from it, even if you know, when you take the headset off, you return to your own reality, and it's like much, you know, you're constantly getting input as being your own body, being in your own situation. Um, I do believe that these experiences matter, right, like they have resonance, um, they stick in your memory. And they're changing the sort of composition of the way you think or your own sort of understanding of your your body um yeah john had mentioned uh virtual reality store and that uh always strikes me as a really uh <laughs> strange thing i noticed that they've uh, exper uh i think it's whole, is it whole foods that experimented with the uh no cashier cashless store that you just walk into and that scans your your card and you pick your things and you leave and it builds you and uh, from what i've heard so far is that's not real popular people are, really want to see somebody that they can ask uh, about the product they're looking for and a vr version of that would be uh, kind of creepy i think yeah yeah i mean you couldn't even really like see produce right or you wouldn't be able to trust but it wasn't rotten. Well, this I mean, this reminds me that when I was doing technology development with Whole Foods Market myself, um, we called in people from the field to discuss the uh, online store that we were going to build. And uh, the, they went immediately to the idea of having simulations of shelves and products on shelves where you could just go along and pick them, which would be 
you know, a terribly inefficient way to construct the thing. But people, you know, people think in terms of what they know, right? So it made sense to them that this is a way that you might might build an, an e-commerce system. Mm. But I think it would be extremely difficult to to use and to navigate, and it certainly would be um, inefficient in any number of ways. So they never ended up building that, did they? We didn't build it that way, no. We we built a fairly traditional e-commerce system. I mean, you know, you have a picture of something and and uh, some information about it and price and so forth and a, a buy button. Uh, e-commerce has been that way pretty much all along. And uh, uh, I have yet to say, well, with one exception, I, I haven't seen an attempt to create a VR store, but um, that was one of the first things I saw post meta announcement. Yeah, I think this was in uh, um, a session from South by Southwest. It was actually one of the COVID years when South by Southwest was more virtual. And I was watching a virtual session. I didn't watch the whole thing. Uh, I didn't have much stomach for it, but um, it was a, uh, it was a guy basically showing how you could build a market using VR and give people a way to interact with this this three dimensional market that uh, you know had basically picking products it very similar to what people had suggested many years ago at Whole Foods, and I just don't see the point, yeah. you know. Though it could be, if you could give somebody a, a way to virtually try on a blouse, that might make sense, right? A virtual fitting room, but I don't really see how that would work exactly. I mean, it's not like you just put on 3D goggles and work your way into this blouse and get the sizing right and all of that. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a it's fantasy. A question of like what why what is exciting people about an idea like that i think part of it is just like hype of being excited that they could simulate something that seems like reality like i think that's because that technology still isn't great you know that i think that does excite people still but for what reason do you want to be moving through a store what do i like about being in a grocery store a lot of it is about seeing people smells well you know i think the, i don't the know big... if it matters the big question for me is what's what's the most human way to use these things? I mean, mm -hmm. you and I have a common friend in Doug Rushkoff, and he's been talking about Team Human, and mm -hmm. and his whole thing is like, okay, we have all of these emerging technologies kind of exploding around us. How do we retain our humanity? How do we find the human use of these technologies? Is, given capitalism, the interest is not so much in human use of technology as in best way to exploit technology and extract, you know, profit from it. So how do we demand that, that a, if a virtual reality was to, I mean, if virtual re reality or AI is to become a thing, if any of these technologies are to become um, com a compelling part of our environment, how do we ensure that they do, that they're not, uh at odds with our essential humanity mm. yeah i mean this is why i think I'm, I'm fascinated with what artists are doing in this space um i think i think it's always like really useful to look at artists when there's ever a new like technology or medium um to see all right so there's there's these things that meta wants us to do with the technology right that might be incredibly dehumanizing and might just purely have a profit motive um, or like a surveillance capitalist motive. Um, but then this this medium also exists, right? As something that can provide a platform for artists, right? And a, a, maybe a new creative platform or stretch their creativity to new limits. Um, and so in my dissertation, I've been focusing on like four primary strands of VR art. The first one being these hybrid ecologies, people that are thinking about human nature relationships in new ways um, that I think can have like really significant political import for how people are thinking about the way we treat our environment. Um, I also focus on feminist and queer VR experiences that are telling narratives um, of relations, of new different ways of relation that are outside patriarchal models um, of relation. I also focus on cultural expression, right? So uh, there's a lot of Black futurism and Indigenous futurism 
um, and other cultural narratives that are using the platform as a way to say like, hey, this is a narrative that's been silenced, um, whether it's a spatial one, whether it's a historical one, an understanding of our human environment relationships as my culture sees it, um, or my culture's relationship to New York City or my culture's relationship to a mountain, um, that these can be like really important new ways of envisioning space that the built world that we live in has maybe erased in the past. So I think there's some creative work going on there that is providing access to like different um, different models of the world that maybe like we don't have access to because of the way they've been sort of erased throughout history. Um, and the final one that I'm really interested in is what I call sensory alterity, which is giving people just entirely different ways of sensing themselves in space. So there's ones where like, for instance, you put on a breathing apparatus and instead to navigate up and down, instead of moving a joystick or looking up and down, your, your breath controls your movement. Um, and so these you know, a breath in lifts you up, a breath out sinks you down. And so there's these sorts of really interesting ways um, that VR can be used in that way, I think, to like dishabituate, or like to say, your the normalized ways that you relate to your body or to your world. So that maybe the VR experience is just a blip in time and you're gonna take the headset off, but maybe doing that makes you sort of more aware of what you what you sort of take for granted in your normal life world or your normal experience of your body or your normal experience of space um, or the city you live in or whatnot. And so I'm interested in, I think this can be a very like human driven imperative um, of VR that is doing work to sort of undo erasure, doing work to sort of resensitize people to their mechanisms of relating to their environments. Um, and I feel pretty optimistic about a lot of the work I've seen artists do in this vein. The folks that won South by's VR competition this year were like a group of 20 year olds who had made an exhibit called Body of Mind that was centering trans narratives and giving VR viewers the experience of like shifting between different bodily forms um, while listening to testimonies from their friends that um, were trans. And so there's like all these really sort of interesting new narratives that are getting a platform through VR and through its speci like specific affordances of having a different experience of embodiment um, and relation that, yeah, I think, I think can be used to good ends. Have you, do you see uh, VR being a, a good tool to use in education, in the educational field of, you know, creating things for students to experience that they might not ever have the opportunity to experience in, you know, in their classroom? Yeah, I think that can be incredibly useful, right? I mean, I think, there's something about it that is still exciting. Um, of course, it's not like equally distributed, right? So who gets access to these headsets is a huge problem, um, but there's some pretty cool like low tech cardboard ones you can even make that if you can give someone the experience of seeing a place they've never been before, or like there's a lot of stuff in ancient worlds being rendered now, like so you can get archeological lessons or historical lessons the same way, honestly, like Assassin's Creed does or something like that, if you can bring people into these narratives um, through an exciting new technology, I think there's huge benefits to that. Or even like doing a frog dissection in VR rather than having to use an actual frog could be really helpful, right? It would be helpful to the frog for sure. Yeah. <laughs> what have you seen that surprised you? I think the thing that surprised me most has been people playing with these sorts of experiences that are really, really taking into serious consideration the onboarding and offboarding process of VR. So things that are like sort of a mixed reality experience more so where it's like you have you have an experience with the VR headset off um, before and then you put the VR headset on and then you have an experience after you take it off. These have surprised me the way that people are being so thoughtful about thinking about the entire VR experience um, that really like it does seem to sort of help alleviate this problem of like the disjuncture between two realities that I think a lot of people think of material reality or physical reality, virtual reality being really separate and different. Um, but to have this sort of like bleed through between these experiences, I think actually like does something really important philosophically or ethically to weave the worlds together and to think like about the resonance between the two realities with each other. Um, that has been really cool. What's it, what's uh, surprised me in a terrifying way, I think, is being at VR Expos where there's a lot of focus on teleoperation. So like 
doing body tracking so that you can be in a warehouse and be operating a robot who's doing the work for you. This um, just, I, I, <laughs> it seems really crazy and really sort of dystopic to me to have that much like alienation from labor practices um, that is just wild to see and sort of hard to imagine trusting this sort of like teleoperation or doing your work through a robot and not even really knowing what's going on or where it is. But it's like, uh, are you saying that you're sort of wearing something that you move and the robot moves with you? Is it that kind of thing? It yeah, seems like it would make sense to just put you there. Why Why? Why, why mediate with the robot? Yeah, that's the question. I mean, they, there's like arguments for it being safer, but I, I don't know. It seems silly. Well, it could make sense in, say, a... a if you were if you had a nuclear meltdown somewhere and you had to send you had things that people could do most effectively and you could actually build robots that could simulate that kind of work but one thing that has always struck me is it, it seems to me odd to think of robots as being humanoid mm -hmm. it's it's probably not the most efficient way to build a machine to do like whatever particular thing you want to do it's another one of those instances where you sort of go to what you know, but it doesn't. It's not necessarily the most efficient way to do it. Right. You know. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Robbie the robot. I mean, actually, God, yeah. I was going to say he wasn't that humanoid. He was <laughs> pretty machine-like. If you remember Robbie, that was in Forbidden Planet. Yeah, yeah. Which was. Uh, probably the first film I ever saw that included a robot really? that that really sort of was a compelling robot figure. And uh, I, I think this is, there's a problem with science fiction in that it gets into our heads to the extent that we start to accept things as being likely that are probably very, very unlikely. You know, time travel for existence. It's very unlikely that anybody's ever going to travel through time, but but people, I think people kind of just assume that time travel is a thing that's going to happen or that may be happening already. You know, I mean, that's, that's all off subject. Oh, go ahead. No, it's interesting thinking about like just in my my focus on like techno capitalism or tech centered capitalism too that a lot of folks that are like in charge of huge amounts of um have a lot of sway in how technology is developing and have a lot of money to make it happen are really deeply informed you know are people that like read science fiction like william gibson is like always quoted in these meetings right or um it's really like the imaginaries formed from science fiction that are becoming material realities you can see like why that's so exciting right it's so it's so exciting especially to see like maybe you grew up with these narratives and then to watch it materialize is really wonderful for a lot of people um but i think it's also something that really like frightens me in thinking like how how excited are you about particular narratives about like leaving earth right or about sort of dematerialized like nfts or this sort of um virtual reality that maybe like takes attention away from some really serious like socio-material concerns of the present right that to be dreaming forth into the future so much that you're sort of like willfully disengaged from the present i think is a, a danger for sure you know one narrative that has um, emerged especially as the with the current uh, disputes about ai is there's camps that say oh it's great it's gonna really revolutionize uh, the way work is done or where we do you know, almost anything and the other side is yeah it's a way of getting rid of humans doing the work so it's cheaper to have ai than to have a bunch of you know human beings doing the same thing and that seems like that's going to be going that argument is going to be going on for quite some time and i'm not sure <laughs> how it's going to be resolved. Yeah, there's I, something about these debates, like this fear of not having jobs um, that lacks imagination to me, I think, because, I mean, of course, there will always be like skill. We have to value ourselves, right? That we have creative capacities. We have some sort of skills that like a robot won't ever be able to simulate. But say, worst case scenario, they do, then like, what does that free us up to do right like say 
we're not working in the same way that we are. We're not being exploited in the same way we are. We're not sort of struggling um, under capitalism the same way we are. Environments aren't being degraded in the same way. You know, what what state would that put you in? You know, they there's so much fear about this in the university of like kids not writing essays anymore. And I'm like, well, yeah, sure. There's like some really important training on how to write an essay, but also like then what can they do with their free time, right? Maybe they'll be doing like amazing pursuits. Maybe they'll have creative energy to do other things. Like the assumption that people not working will just lead to like laziness or non-production, I think doesn't give us a lot of credit, you know? Well, I think the adoption of AI didn't mean that people are not going to have jobs anymore. It's just that they're going to have different kinds of jobs. Um, one, one thing I've noticed is that while you have people who are expressing a lot of concern about AI taking jobs from people, there's actually a huge conversation about how do I get into AI? What kind of jobs can I get in AI? And, you know, like a prompt engineer, there's going to be a huge demand for prompt engineers. And it's a very interesting discipline that it requires. I mean, there's probably an art to it, really. Not everybody would probably make a good prompt engineer. Um, and that's like an inherent requirement in the, the broad use of AR is to have that kind of talent, you know, people who can actually write the queries basically is what it is. And, um, well, I don't know. I, are we drifting too far from VR? I wonder to what extent have you seen connections between AI and v, VR that you thought were interesting? People are yeah really excited about these connections. I think like there's one thing about gaming that for like um, world building right for like an open world game or you could have an AI like generate storylines, plot lines, characters, landscapes, that sort of thing. There's a lot of excitement about how huge that could get for gaming. Um, I think in this sort of like context awareness like like if you're doing workplace simulation or if you're doing um like communication simulation or something that there's a lot that can be done there as well and sort of like streamlining um that sort of process i think there's also like a, a more frightening side to it in terms of surveillance um in that right now all vr headsets pretty much have eye tracking and gaze tracking cameras um and this has like been a huge problem and that there's no like real strong overarching legislation about how this data is collected because it's a new sort of biometric way of regulating the body so you know you usually also have hand trackers right that are telling your gestures sometimes you have additional body trackers that are tracking other points in your body um, and what AI can do in algorithmic analysis with all these things is make a whole lot of assumptions a whole lot of inferences about your attention about what colors you like about um, what your habits of using technology are, what your wingspan is, what your health is, how tired you are if you're on drugs, um, all sorts of like inferences that it's able to make paired then with like your habits actually within VR in terms of like what programs you use, if it's connected to a profile, who you're talking to, it's recording all your conversations, all your texts, all your speech, everything you're listening to, and also has these cameras on the outside. So it's recording your room, it's recording everyone that passes through your room. And so this is where like the contextual awareness, the sort of autonomy of the body begins to be lost. And you're putting it through these algorithms with AI that are making assumptions saying, hey, you're looking at blue all the time and you really like sports. And so I'm, you know, as meta, going to go onto Instagram and give you sports equipment with a blue background and advertise that way to you. Right. And so it becomes this like very sort of intricate web um, that they're able to weave, particularly enhanced by new AI advancements um, about just like being a subject, being a body, um, being a technology user that feels to me um, new because it is so like physical and it's new types of data that, they're, that we don't really have protection over. If all they're going to use that data for is to serve me an ad, I'm not too concerned, but I can think of other things they might use it for, and I'm more concerned about those. And I don't know that legislation, I mean, there can be legislation, and it would be good to have legislation about how that data and other data is used, but I'm not sure that's going to prevent people from misusing the data that they've collected. Right. And uh, that 
to me, that suggests that it's important to help people have a literacy about these kinds of technologies. And we're kind of way behind that. I mean, people don't have a literacy about the basic technologies that we're using every day right now. And it's going to be that much harder to create people who really understand AI, really understand VR, really understand how all of these technologies are used and and uh, abused. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think EFF probably does some cool stuff about this. Education. Yeah. I know that's always I, that's always been EFF's thing. Yeah. But it's it's strange, right? That people don't seem too worried about learning for the most part. Um, and it, yeah, it sort of reveals a lot about like how willing we are to let technologies shape us. And in this way, like we were talking about Google Maps earlier, there's a lot of people that have theorized like this like atrophy of our ability to navigate ourselves through space because we're so reliant on Google Maps, which I, I definitely like think is the case for me that I'm not really paying attention to a route as much anymore if I know I have the map that can do it for me. Um, and so if you start thinking about AR, maybe having these same effects, right, is if you're used to the sort of information coming through you um, and you're not having to do the work, then what parts of our sort of awareness or attention to conversation might change? Um, and then what sort of trust are you putting in the machine? You know, it's a, it's a whole lot of trust in this relationship where more and more of our daily like life activities are being guided. Yeah, and we all know that AIs hallucinate. Yeah. So yeah. If, if we're looking for guidance from an AI, we better think twice. Well, what specific environments have you been working with lately? Um, let's see. I mean, I've seen most recently, I went to a festival in Paris called New Images Festival. Um, one of my favorite ones there was like a envisioning, it was called Plastisapiens. It's an envisioning of like a future world where humans have had to learn how to coexist with all the plastic matter we've put into Earth. Um, so I've been talking with those folks a lot, and that's a really interesting program. Um, myself, I'm working on a project right now about, y'all know the Treaty Oaks tree here? So me and a professor of mine are creating a virtual environment of the Treaty Oaks tree because it's got this crazy contested history, right? All these layers of different events that have happened to it. Um, and so we wanted to use this VR environment as a way of making this sort of um, strange layering of histories that the user has to encounter and sort of unravel. Um, and so we've been using a lot of photogrammetry technology where you take a lot of pictures of something and it creates it into a digital object um, of the tree, which is this beautiful, like hybrid, amazing big tree, but filled with bricks, right? And filled with like all of this infrastructure and uh, cement and stuff to keep it up. Um, yeah, and it was almost murdered. Right, yeah, so yeah. it was poisoned in the 80s, right? Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. So we're, we've been playing with this as a way of thinking, how can we use VR to sort of do a land acknowledgement or do a sort of unraveling of a land's history um, in a city, right? To sort of show different parts um, of the history that you don't get when you're just encountering it on the street. Um, so this has been fun because we're really playing with multi-sensory technologies using different audio recordings. Like we stuck a geophone into the soil of the tree and recorded it that way and have been using contact microphones on its bark to record that and then binaural audio to record um, the traffic and the birds all around the tree. Um, so it's been, you know, this is my sort of favorite ex type of experiment with VR is just thinking what kind of information can you put in to build this environment, really this digital environment um, and what effect will that have on people's understanding of the physical place itself? Yeah, I mean, people do, do take I, trees, I mean, they take trees for granted, I was going to say, but they take nature for granted. They don't, it's like we walk through it and are kind of unaware of it. We don't think about it. I was among the redwoods not long ago, just a week or so ago. And uh, uh, of course, redwoods are pretty imposing and they make you pretty aware of, of them. But I was thinking at the time about the extent to which I moved through space uh, with minimal awareness of the space I'm moving through, you know, uh, or maybe I'm in my head. And, you know, as someone who does like meditation, um, I'm pretty sensitive to that. And I'm supposed to be really working on it. 
but it's still a huge problem. And if it's a huge problem for somebody who actually does meditate and tries to be in the present moment a lot, it's, it's probably an, uh, an enormous problem for other people. Right, right. And it seems like VR is one use of VR could be to sensitize people to their surroundings. In a strange way, because immediately what it does is like remove you from your surroundings, right, in some way. Um, but this is what I like is like these, there's VR experiences that are, you know, calling you back. Think about where you are. Like, what does it mean that you are there? What are you standing on? What's going on around you? Um, that sort of thing, I think. It does have an interesting opportunity there, right? And saying, yeah. okay, it's making the claim, it's important to be in space. This is why the technology exists, right? So what can you do with that if you take it off? Maybe there's an awareness of the importance of like, being a body in space and what that means. Um, that can do a lot of like interesting philosophical work and can also, I think, do a lot of interesting environmentalist work um, or social political work, you know, to think about what it means to be present in a place, in a city, what it means to be like entangled with different species or different environments or political infrastructures going on here, um, to feel like a real sense of presence and belonging to your world, I think. Fascinating. Well, we have reached the end of the hour. Uh, and I really want to thank you. And I know Scoop thanks you, if he will unmute for joining us and this has been a fascinating discussion so Thank thanks so much you can follow the plutopia news network at plutopia.io on facebook go to at plutopia news on twitter it's at plutopia with john lepkowski i'm scoop sweeney this is the plutopia news network 20 minutes into the future <laughs>